Uh, John, if my audio goes wacko, let me know and I'll, I'll move okay. inside. But it just was such a nice morning. I, I love I love the overcast here, uh, and uh, the marine layer is is my friend. Uh, and of course, this conversation would probably be much more interesting after our second glass of wine. Oh, but yeah. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna try it on coffee this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and I was saying before we got on, I had at least two cups so I could try to get close to John's energy level. Um, let's start with uh, finding out how a nice Midwestern boy made it out to uh, San Diego and, and Baja California. Okay. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Well, many of you know I'm from a, really a tiny rural town in, in the Midwest, in cent West Central Illinois. And I came from a metropolis of 3,000 people, which is the largest town for about an hour's drive. And it's a farming community, all basically the land of soybeans and corn, very flat. Um, so I didn't really ever have an interest in botany at that point um, because it was basically soybeans and corn. Um, so I started off kind of uh, pre-vet med and thought I would be a James Harriet type of uh, uh, veterinarian. And, but when I was in college, it was when, um, um, oh my gosh, what was it called? That farm aid hit. And when all the little mom and pops were going under and uh, farmers, and I started moving towards botany. I had really good botany professors and finished out my degree in, in Illinois. Then, um, found someone who was very kind of classically trained alpha taxonomist in plants in Missouri. So I moved southwest to southwest Missouri, to Springfield, Missouri. And then um, after that, found another professor after finishing my master's in Arizona State uh, that was also, uh, did cytogenetic work, but also very classical in, in orientation. And then moved to Arizona State. And that gave me the ability to start exploring in Baja California. I got close enough to that point and fell in love with Baja California long before I ever even heard of California. <laughs> I mean, Baja California was the thing first. And um, then it ended up after I was finishing my PhD, um, well, I had a Fulbright in Ensenada. And during that time, I visited San Diego for the first time. Um, I came up with some students and faculty from Mexico, visited the museum, and of course fell in love with the museum as well. And so I found out that, you know, the history of the museum being near Baja California and just the, being, the proximity of San Diego being on the verge of Baja California, it was the place for me. So that's kind of, I moved that progressive Southwest. Can't go any further unless I'm going out to Hawaii. <laughs> And you have been out to the Pacific Islands, so you have gone a little, far, I, a little yeah. farther west and out to the Channel Islands. So, uh, oh yes, we gotta yes. we gotta sort of reel you back. Uh, <laughs> well, that's interesting. It seems like both areas have kind of wide open spaces, though. Oh you're yeah, not a, you're not a deep forest kind of. No, person. no, <laughs> definitely not. That you're too big to the, make it through the understory. <laughs> I was the one on there saying, where do I want to hike? The deserts. The deserts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think those people don't understand the desert. You have to appreciate that. It is, I mean, the diversity, but it's not in your face. So you have to kind of look a little bit harder, but it's, you know, it's an amazing place to, to go to. Yeah, when I first arrived, um, it, was, it was Super Bloom that year and to, to welcome me. And I went out with you, John, and uh, I was all excited about seeing the fields of flowers. And, and no, I mean, for those of you who've been out with John before, you understand um, he did not want to see any of the really pretty stuff. <laughs> we, we found thread flowers. I remember they were <laughs> the most exciting things were like the belly plants that uh, were, were rarely up. And I know they were exciting too, but uh, he definitely doesn't go for the, the showy. Um, well, I think one of one of my favorite stories that I've heard you tell, and I'd love to have everyone hear it, is about your run-in with pirates. I know you've gone to a lot of lengths for in, in the name of science, but uh, your run-in with pirates is is over the top. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of people, um, you know, I think people worry about going to Mexico in in general, and 
you know, I, I actually feel very, very comfortable there because I get away from the cities and I'm not in the city at all. And so I go to really remote areas and I feel very, very comfortable. But um, I have had a few run-ins over the, my gosh, 30 years of going into Baja California now. Um, and one of those was, I don't know, it was probably about six or seven years ago, possibly. And we connected with the government agency, CONAMP, that runs the, the islands of the Gulf Reserve. And so I took somebody from there and also a researcher from Arizona went with us. And to be honest on that trip, we had, we had heard from an archeologist, there was a place we wanted to go on Isla Angel de la Guarda, which is a massive island and almost very little of it is explored because it's so hard to get around. It's large and there's no water basically. And so we, set up this whole expedition to go there and brought a free climber with us because there was a rock wall that you couldn't go and explore the area unless you went up this wall. <laughs> and so I knew I couldn't do it and I'm pretty good in the field, but um, this guy was amazing. He went right up it without any trouble, brought a rope and every day we would go explore. We'd go up this rope and then go explore these remote areas. Well, we got a Ponga to drop us off on Isla Angel, and they left us there. We were gonna be there for, I think, four or five days. And we had brought all of our supplies, and we stashed it behind a big berm on the beach and kind of covered it so nobody could see it. But the winds came up on the Gulf and while we were inland. I mean, we had, had to hike about, I think it was about a 12-mile hike in where we set up base camp and um, maybe eight miles, eight to somewhere in there. Um, and so we had to carry everything with us there. And then we had these two people that would run back to the, to the beach, grab more supplies and bring it back. So it was a long hike for them while we did all the exploration. Well, the, everything was going wonderful. We had enough water, everything seemed good. And all of a sudden, um, on the way out, we had left all of our supplies with the graduate student and one other person, the climber guy, um, in at the base camp, and they were gonna spend one more night there. And we went to the, to the beach, and um, it was a major hike, and I had actually two people that get, got heat fatigue on this trip, so that is not a good thing. Um, they are, you have to take all their weight and everything at that point. But we made it to the beach and found out that somebody had stolen everything that we had left there, except they couldn't take all the water. We had so much water that they couldn't take it all, but they took every drop of food, everything. And um, we were a little worried, but I had a satellite phone. And we ended up calling a Ponga in that could come in the next day. And we went into like survival mode, you know, well, there were some Western gull nests and we could eat eggs if we had to, and we could harvest some seeds of cacti. And uh, we found out that I could live on, um, I think it was eight pecans for 24 hours and I was fine. Oh, and instant coffee. <laughs> so instant coffee was perfectly fine. <laughs> no water really, but just the, the powder. So it was a little scary, but um, it, we got off without any trouble and, um, uh, no worse for the wear, actually, and had somebody come and pick us up. Were the pirates ever apprehended? Well, actually, I can tell you it was a little more exciting than that <laughs> because um, the, we knew, we found out, we thought there's no way anybody could find our stash. But when the winds blew, there was a little tiny bay and some fishermen came in and they were from Sonora. And the reason we know that is because they left some wrappers from a tortilleria in Sonora and they had killed a sea turtle and ate it that night. And so, which is totally illegal. Um, and so we knew they were from that. And the day we were going to come out and our ponga had come to pick us up, a ponga came up as well by the, the island and they stopped not long, not too far out. 
and um, our Pongero had a radio, and we were sure these were the people that stole of our stuff. They were probably coming back to get the rest of it, and but they had no um, no signs or anything on their boat, so we didn't know. You know, we couldn't call them in as fishermen. You're supposed to have tags and things on your boat, and the Pongero got on the radio and said, okay, Navy, this is them, come and get them. And immediately that boat just headed off about 100 miles an hour. And of course he was making it up, but uh, we got out fine, but it was, it was a little exciting for a while. <laughs> I, I think you're, I, I think the, um, you're not knowing whether it was eight or 12 miles is a good indication of what it's like to hike with John. <laughs> <laughs> People describe them as death marches <laughs> because, <laughs> because you will, uh, you know, the promise of, of, uh, of a new species will keep you going when the rest of us are ready to lie down and cry. Um, so I know you've gone to great lengths in the name of science and, oh, yeah. and that's one of the stories. What's, what's another one that you, you, extreme that you had to go to for? Well, I, I will tell the you the one, if, if you see my virtual background, that is actually one of my favorite places on the peninsula. And I would say that almost very few people have ever seen it. And that is in the top of the Sierra de la Libertad, which is about halfway down the peninsula. And it's very difficult to access. There's no roads or anything in that area. But if you look, those are, well, those are shadows there of the palms, but those are the Mexican blue fan palms and they occur on the tops. They're not in arroyos or canyons or anything. They're across the top of this area, which is really unique in the top of the Sierra. But to get there, it took an eight day mule ride um, to get into this region. You could have done it faster, but you know, we're stopping and exploring and, and collecting. But I, I have to tell you, that is one of the areas I'd love to get back to. It's, it's hard to get to, but it, yielded new species, new records for the peninsula. It was just, it's a stunning untouched part of, of the peninsula. And uh, I, probably one of the more difficult areas to get to. And you say, oh, you were on a mule that whole time. How hard can that be? Well, at that point in my life, um, <laughs> I didn't, uh, I was a little bit better shape and I'm a large person and can hike pretty fast. And there's never enough animals when we go on these trips. So I ended up doing hiking pretty much the entire way and amongst the, the mules because everybody else was not as quite a fast hiker. So I could hike almost to the speed of the mules. And I got a nickname uh, during that trip by the locals and they called me Padre, Padre Juan because it was like I was following the Camino Real and the Padres would uh, hike from here to there. <laughs> so that was my, that is my name in that area. <laughs> Can't hear you. Oh, I think you're muted, Judy. You're muted. Sorry, I wanted to remind everyone that if you do have questions, you can put them in the, in the Q&A. Otherwise, I'm gonna keep running through my list. Um, and, but I'm sure, I know many of you know John fairly well, and this is your opportunity to ask something embarrassing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you have, you have uh, named many, many new species and, and made a ton of discoveries. Are there, which are the ones that stand out to you as sort of the most exciting? Well, I can tell you that right now, the most exciting find for me is one that I haven't described that I'm working on, and it's taken a lot of time and effort to do this one. But it is a shrub in the middle of Isla Natividad, and that is um, off of the Pacific coast, kind of between the point of the Viscano and Cedros Island, which is the big island there. And Natividad's a tiny island. And it was not known to have any endemic plants at all. And during an expedition in 2015, we just happened to stop on this island. And I went off hiking um, with a couple of uh, friends and we were collecting you know, everything that we can and what we came upon. And we came into a little valley, just a one little canyon in 
in the middle of this island that it, very few people get to. There isn't a trail or anything to this area. And found a shrub. And the shrub was in fruit. Um, and I thought I knew what it was. I thought it was a thing called Ebenopsis confine, which is what we call Palo Fierro, but not the Palo Fierro that you know, or more commonly what we called it is dog poop bush, because dog poop bush has a big woody pod that kind of looks like poo, dried poo in the, in the shrub. But it didn't have a fruit like that. It actually has a spiraling fruit that was soft walled but the plant looked identical to that shrub. And that completely baffled me. I mean, I'm like, what is this? I it doesn't, a lot of times our, you know, discoveries are more in the herbarium and they're almost a lot like another species rather than something blatantly different than you get on, you go, aha, you know, that kind of thing. Doesn't happen that often. And this was one of those aha moments that you're like, I've never ever seen anything like this before. And so we collected it in fruit and um, I thought about it and thought about it. I brought it back to the museum, compared it. I could not get it to compare to anything from our entire region. And I actually kind of excited that it might be a new genus, not just a new species, but a new genus for science, which happens very rarely these days. Um, and it is um, still not described because I didn't get flowers on it. And, but um, we did a trip to this island to get the flowers, but missed them. They weren't, they had already flowered. It is so hard to, these, these islands are in the mid peninsula, so their rainfall is not normal and you just don't know when things are gonna flower. But what we did is we connected with some local women at the fishing village there who are absolutely amazing and they like to hike and we took them we when we arrived we took them with us to the site and said this is the plant and they had never seen it before they live on the island they've never seen this before but they got very excited about it um, and I got to give you just a little sidebar here because we took two girls with us as well from the, from the little fishing village. And one is named Jimena and the other one was Katarina. And they were about the same age as my daughter. So they're like, we're 12 to 13. And they went on this and it was not an easy hike and there were things ripping us apart and they didn't complain. You knew they were not happy because their moms were making them go, but they didn't complain. And I thought, well, if this is gonna be a new species, I think they ought to come up with a common name because there's no common name for this thing. And I let them all think about it. And what they decided is they said it was the spiniest, most horrible bush you can imagine. This thing, it just will rip you apart. But these girls decided that they would take the first parts of their names and they would call it Hika. So Jimena and Katarina and they would call it Hika Espinosa. So a very spiny Hika. And I said, that is absolutely perfect. So we now have a common name, we just don't have it formally described, but I think it gives them, it's the first endemic to that island, and I think it gives them something, you know, for hopefully generations to come to be proud of, that is something unique to their island um, as well. But, so that is right now probably my most exciting, because I still, they got flowers for us, so they actually sent them to me via Ensenada, and now I can describe it. But I think I'm gonna have to put it in a genus from kind of Southern and Eastern Mexico at this point, rather than a new genus. But it is way out of range. We have nothing like it in the peninsula. So very exciting. So since you mentioned your daughter, I know you have two kids. Mm -hmm. are, they, are they both uh, outdoor? Outdoorophiles like you? <laughs> they you make they them? <laughs> like to be outdoors. I would say they're not into botany at all. <laughs> oh, my kids rejected science too. <laughs> the, uh, I have my daughter, I started early. I think some of you have seen in the Baja uh, Plant Field Guide, there's a picture of her pressing plants with me when she was very young. Um, I, they appreciate it um, a lot, but I don't think they have an interest in it as much. Probably because dad's gone all the time, let's be honest. <laughs> the science has taken him away quite a bit. <laughs>
But they enjoy the the mud up in Alaska. Oh gosh, yes. No, they they I that's one of the big things. You know, we get all this outdoor time, but they really they enjoy the outdoors in general. We we do get out hiking and camping and and of course every summer we go up to Alaska and and spend time at our fish site in our shacks and really commune with nature for a few weeks. <laughs> And for those of you who didn't hear uh, John's Brown Bag Lunch uh, presentation the other day, he spends a month in, in uh, shacks without plumbing and electricity and uh, <laughs> salmon fishing yep. and, and, nope. and, and shooting bears. Well, shooting, no. keep no. them away. <laughs> <laughs> We're not shooting bears. <laughs> That's a last resort. No, but I have to tell you, I'm kind of not a big gun supporter. Um, and when I'm down here, but I am a gun toting and a redneck when I'm up there because it's a necessity when we're out on the beach in the middle of nowhere with uh, salmon and kids <laughs> and bears of, of all sorts there. So uh, you mentioned the collections. I know we have a remarkable collection for its longevity and for the sort of depth of knowledge for California and the Baja Peninsula. Uh, can you tell us uh, just a couple of highlights? I mean, if somebody was coming in and they could just look at one specimen or two, what would you take them to see? Well, we do have a John Muir collection, uh, which many people get very excited about. It's a fern a collection. Um, we also have our oldest collection is from the 1820s, and it came in exchange. Um, it is in the Crashalacy, which my uh, the genus Sedum, it's called Sedum anglicum, and it is an exchange from the herbarium in, um, uh, in Vienna. And so it came because my predecessor studied that family, and they obviously did an exchange to get him to know that, that particular species. So that's our oldest uh, collection in the herbarium. Um, I, I mean, I think there's there's fascinating stories with any of the, the collections. For me, when I see those things, I remember those trips that I've been on. <laughs> when I look at my own, my own collections there, which are now becoming substantial in our collection, I think 37,000 now of my own collections there. But um, it is, I, I love like going back through Reed Moran's collections, um, who, you know, he got throughout the peninsula and was one of the best exploring botanists on the peninsula for 30 plus years and so it's wonderful to see those and those of you who haven't done it you, you should not only see his collections because we're digitizing left and right so you can actually see a lot of these specimens but also his field notes are available online and so on our Baja Flora and if you go to that he was he is an eloquent writer in his field notes unlike me I'm like just the facts, and you can barely read my writing. But uh, no, he was absolutely amazing, and his stories are sometimes a little controversial, and talking about people in his group and, um, and people that were leading him, and uh, uh, very honest in his field books. And uh, so if you get a chance, those are totally available. You can read about some of his trips, and there was one about an adventure where you know, they were losing mules, falling off cliffs, and mountain lions getting mules, and this was like a, a trip for many, many days across long portions of the peninsula, and, or many actually weeks, I should say, but uh, those are fully open to people to explore and read, so I, I think those are parts of the things that are exciting. But let me give you one other thing, because this is something I've worried about right now, and because we're constantly finding, you think of these discoveries and you're like, oh, John gets to go to remote areas and explore this part and go on mules and that kind of stuff. But actually a lot of my exploration right now, especially during COVID, because I can't go down into Baja, um, have been in the herbarium. So our collections, you think that we have them all identified correctly. I'm sorry to tell you, we do not. Uh, there are things in there that we have all missed everybody for a hundred plus years. And so I get a chance now and then to sit down with our collections and compare them all side by side, looking for things. And during that 
that has now been a huge source of discovery. Um, I think in the last two weeks, I found two new species for the peninsula just by sitting down with our collection. And so they're undescribed. And I think when we get a chance again to go into the field, we'll go test those and, and look for them again. But um, I think you know this whole process of us trying to digitize our collections and get them out there, hopefully more people will have that ability to look through them and actually do comparison and say, hey, this one looks a little different. We need to test it a little further. So the collections are amazing. Uh, the museum's collections are off the charts because of the history of collecting in, in, in our region. Oh, you're, you're we, are, we are getting close to the end, but we have two really great questions. So I'm going to okay. see if you can speed answer both of them. Um, the first is if there is anything we would love to obtain for the collection. And the second is whether you have advice for young scholars, high school or undergraduates, things you wish you'd, things that worked out for you that you'd done along the way that you would do again, things you wouldn't do next time. Um, so <laughs> if you can answer those two uh, okay. questions in the next couple really of minutes. <laughs> the, uh, the first one about what I would do, you know, I came from the Midwest, I told you I was from very, um, kind of what we'd say white bread Midwest and to go to another country and live and experience a culture and of course the natural history in there was something that is irreplaceable in my life. And so if anybody ever gets the opportunity to do that, I highly recommend it like the Fulbright or living in, in Mexico, just that experience I think has changed my life completely. And a lot, of course, academia, I have to go through all of the academic steps to, to get where I am today. But the whole idea of going to another country, experience thinking, and not just the people and the culture, but also the, the natural history that is there. And the, as far as the collections, I'm not sure I understood that question completely. Um, anything, anything that's missing that you would love to go out and oh, God, have that's, in the collection? <laughs> Just one. <laughs> There's no one. <laughs> there are so many mountains in Baja California that we need to explore. I mean, I hope I can continue to do it until I drop over dead, but it is, there are so many areas that are left that are completely unknown to us that I would love to explore. And we need the, the collections from those before they're altered and changed over time. So it is a race against time, but we need to get out there more and more. So to circle back to wine where we started, it's more about the terroir than the, than the actual plant. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for, um, for uh, being willing to <laughs> sit through some uh, interrogation today and uh, have a conversation. And I want to thank all of our members for joining us. It's, it's always fun. It's great to see uh, to see you at least through the uh, email addresses. And Emily, were you going to wrap things up, or am I supposed to do that? I can jump in. Um, you know, thank you all for joining us. Like Judy said, I'm so glad that um, we could see you all today. Um, we do have another member meetup on October 23rd, um, and that'll be with Margie Dykins. Um, she is our history buff of the um, museum history. This month we are celebrating our 146th birthday. Um, today. So to, yeah. Our anniversary. Yes, our today anniversary. is our anniversary. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, so we're really excited, um, should have some really great stories, um, and so we hope you can uh, join us for that. The sign up is on our website. Um, we hope to see you there. Have a wonderful Friday and a wonderful weekend. Thank you all. <laughs> hope to see you back in the museum soon. Bye.